Have you ever made a print that didn't match your monitor? I bet you have. We've all been in that experience before, where the contrast, the density, the color, the overall feeling just doesn't match that image that you've been working so hard on in the computer. So today I'm gonna to walk you through some basic intro color management concepts, as well as give you some thoughts on best practice and best practice and how to sort of set up your work environment. Um, now I print on a lot of different papers at a lot of different scales. So I have a very tight practice that I never vary from. It allows me to work on materials like hand-coded paper bag materials, hundreds of different handmade papers, coded and uncoded, and get repeatable results. So the first thing that's so important is the environment in which you work. Now I work in a very dim lit room. If you've got bright windows in your room, do something to dim them down. Do put a, curtains up, put a, rollers up, put cardboard over it, I don't care. You have to be working in a dimly lit room. That's the best way for your eyes to be responding to the monitor. Additionally, uh, make sure that the room is ideally neutral in color. Um, I like working in a room that's very gray, very neutral, so I'm not being influenced by any of the color palettes or anything around me. It's just super important. Also, when you're evaluating work, I like to look at work in a neutral space, and then I'll take it to other spaces. I'll put it against a color wall, I'll put it against incandescent, daylight, you know, fluorescent, just to see how the print responds. But I always try to start from a point of neutrality, a point of low light, neutral tones. Um, I'm assuming, I hope, that everybody watching this video is running a calibrated monitor. If your monitor is not calibrated and you don't wanna calibrate your monitor, you might as well press stop right now on this video because every single thing that I'm gonna teach you is going to be irrelevant unless you have a calibrated monitor. Um, calibration tools for monitors have come down a great bit, but you are gonna to have to spend a couple hundred dollars on a proper spectrometer in order to calibrate that screen. Um, ideally, your screen isn't ancient either. It should be within the last four, five, six years. You know, monitors do start to lose some of their brightness over time, and they do start to vary, so it's really important that you have a fairly recent, fairly good monitor. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars, but buy something that's good and make sure you calibrate it. Now, I have a, a routine that I do. I calibrate my monitor, whether the software tells me to or not, pretty much every 10 days to two weeks. That's just where I'm at. I've got it on my calendar, just a reminder to recalibrate the monitor because um, I work with it a lot and I wanna make sure that when I hit print, what I'm seeing on that screen is gonna come out on the other end. Um, so dark room, neutral space, calibrated monitor. Those three things right there will dial you in so much on good printing. Next, you have to understand uh, a little bit about ICC profiles and color space. So when you have a digital file, if you're bringing the digital file into Photoshop, you know, you've got that raw, and I'm assuming you're shooting a raw file, um, you go into the raw editing program, whether it's in Photoshop or Lightroom, I happen to personally like Photoshop, um, and you have a lot of choices and a lot of options there as to how you want that space to be mapped in, uh, in Photoshop, what color space you wanna work with. Now, I've got two color spaces that everybody I know has installed on their computers, and I would say these are two good default spaces. If you're planning on printing on a glossy paper, that's basically, or satin paper, anything that's gonna be using the photo black, I would recommend in 2024 that you use a space like Adobe RGB 1998 or something similar to that space. I don't like massive spaces like Profoto. That's not a great space to work in. Adobe RGB 1998 is really ideal in size and shape for most glossy, most satin papers. Now, there are spaces that are maybe even a little more specific, but for 90% of work, this is a safe bet. Um, the reason I say that is if you look at the overall gamut volume, the size of Adobe RGB 1998, it's around a million. Um, and if you look at million, I think it's maybe even a little bit more, but right around there. If you look at the gamut volume of most glossy papers made with 11 color uh, printers that most of us are running, like my new Canon ProGraph uh, 4600, its gamut volume for most of its ICC profiles is also about a million. Now what that means is, when I send the data from my computer to my printer, the interpolation between the two, the conversation that I have to have is easier because the spaces are of similar size. And that really matters. Because if you have a space that's huge 
and you're trying to map it to a printer profile that's smaller, all sorts of horrible things are going to happen. You're going to have uh, gamut mapping issues. You're going to have hue angle shifts. We'll talk about that one in a minute. You're going to have issues of stuff just getting cut off or mapped in a way that you don't want. So it's important to think about your, your working color space and then the space that you're going to want to go to at the end. So for glossy satin papers, I recommend Adobe RGB 1998. Now for matte surface papers, Traditionally, I've told people something like sRGB, and the reason is most matte surface papers only have a gambit volume of right around 600,000. And this is true with all of your 11 color printers running the matte black. sRGB has a gambit volume of just over 600,000. Once again, it's a closer mapping space. So if, what you, if you wanna see something on the screen and you wanna see it match on the print, changing that relationship is really important. And this also boils down to what type of ICC profile are you running uh, for the printer? Because if you're running a really bad made ICC profile, that's also a problem. You need to be running professionally built ICC profiles. And the good part is most manufacturers nowadays are providing some pretty exceptional ICC profiles for free. I once again run Colorbyte software of Image Print Black, um, and I think their profiles are amazing. But the better the profile, the closer your two ICCs match, the better your color management is gonna be instantly. It just, it makes such a big difference. Now, I know there are a lot of you out there saying, oh, but when I print on matte surface paper with sRGB, I'm not getting the vibrancy that I would get if I was printing from Adobe RGB 1998 because it's such a bigger space. And I wouldn't disagree with you on that. However, if we're talking about accuracy, which is what I'm the most interested in, you're being more accurate because the spaces are mapping correctly. In Adobe RGB 1998, that mapping from that screen down to that paper is going to look different. There are compromises that have to be made. The space is just so much bigger. And unless you're running really high-end printing software, chances are that's not going to be the best uh, relationship and giving you the best quality. So I'm always into what is going to give me the most accurate color first. And then, if I'm like, okay, I want more color, so I'm gonna work in this other space, and I'm gonna make a few prints, and I don't mind making a couple of extra prints, that's fine. But I think important is to start from a point of accuracy first. So one of the really ugly things that can happen in printing is what's called a hue angle shift. And there's all sorts of things that can cause a hue angle shift to happen, but in a nutshell, it's where a dark color, something like this blue right in here, this dark blues, will shift purple or oranges might shift a little red. And the reason for that is that the color gamut of your input space from Photoshop or Lightroom going into the printer can't map correctly. And as a result, it gets mapped into a different place and it gets, it gets shifts. That's why it's called a hue angle shift. And deep blues are one of the hardest things to reproduce. Deep blues love to go to a purple shade. I'm sure if you've ever had a really beautiful blue sky and you print on a paper, you've noticed that sometimes it'll shift to a purplish tone, especially as the values get darker. Um, and the best way to get around that is to use really good profiles and do all the things that I've already mentioned. Um, and so I thought today I would showcase a, three little prints to sort of illustrate this. Um, the print that we're looking at right here, this area where my wife is at, this once again is hand-coated brown paper bag material. And this is printed on the HP T650, which is the printer that I mentioned in the video yesterday. Um, and it is a combination of dye and pigment. The dyes are incredibly stable and the black pigment is incredibly neutral and, and a nice deep tone to it. And so I'm able to reproduce because the gamut is so big on those dye inks, colors that are really difficult to print even on a highly calibrated, uh, calibrated professional system like an Epson uh, P9000 or my new uh, Canon uh, 4600. Those machines are absolute workhorse monsters, amazing, but they don't have as big a volume and then the color capabilities that dye ink does. Even with those 11 inks, there's just there's still an advantage in certain regions, and I really see the blue being one of the biggest ones. Now, the new Canon, I will say, did better in this test than my previous P9000 did. A lot of the artworks that we've made, every now and then I'll try to run one of them through the P9000 when I had the system, and the blues always gave up like really bad, like really big shift towards purple. 
the Canon didn't do it as much. It did it a little, but not nearly as much. It was much more accurate in terms of color, so I'm really happy about that. So let me show you a couple sample prints. Okay, this first print here, this is just on a nice matte surface paper. I'll zoom it in so you can see it. This is uh, made on the Canon. And what you can see, if you look at Eve's dress, what color do we see it shifting? We see it shifting a little purple, especially when you compare it to the one here. This once again is done with the dye-based inks. So you're seeing a little bit of purple happen and it isn't as accurate as it really should be. It's not bad and this would be something that I could color balance pretty easily in Photoshop, but I'd have to make two prints. And when you're making prints that are nine and 10 feet wide, you wanna make one print. It's just a lot of time and a lot of paper and ink. Now let me show you the version done on the HP on the same paper. So this is once again done on a really high quality professional matte surface inkjet paper. And you notice, I'll show you a side by side in a second, that her dress is not purple, it's blue. It's more saturated by the way, than what I have on the final artwork here. And that's because this is a high quality professional inkjet paper. This is once again, brown paper bags hand coated um, with one coat too. So it's not even a really even coating. Um, so you can see that the dye based inks that are in the Hewlett Packard are able to hit color that the, even the great Canon printer that I just bought can't hit. And now if I show it to you side by side, you'll see that very clearly. You can see that the Canon, which is this one, is uh, a little more purple than the HP. And I'll even flip sides on in case my lights are influencing this in any way, shape or form. But you can see the HP here has a better blue, Better blue in the background. Look at the blue in the trees in the background compared to the Canon 4600. Now, this same thing would hold true if I had a P9000 printer here. It's just the nature of pigment versus dye. So if I'm trying to make really beautiful, outrageous color prints, I'm almost always gonna turn to a hybrid type printer that is using a combination of pigment and dye. If I'm working uh, on glossy paper, um, you know, it's not as much of an issue because glossy papers have a much bigger gamut volume. However, this also boils down to good practices in Photoshop, into doing proper soft proofing, into making sure, once again, that that monitor is calibrated and you're in a dark room and it's kind of neutral tone. Also making sure that uh, you're checking to make sure that you're not putting images out of gamut. If you're running blues out of gamut on, in, in Adobe RGB 1998, you're gonna have huge issues when you go to print on a glossy paper. You need, to, you need to be careful about that kind of stuff. So I hope you found this video helpful. I hope it gave you some thoughts on better color management. If you do not have an, a, a calibrator for your monitor, go buy one the moment this video stops. So if you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe. Um, and if you're ever in Southern Vermont and you'd like to actually come see works by Eve and Steve in person, you can drop me a note and we can try to set up a time to meet so I can give you a tour of the studio. It's really kind of an amazing space. And to be able to see the work in person is just so important. Oh, and by the way, one little final little tech note, for this video, I did color balance the video so everything was color corrected as close as we can get. I'm not sure how YouTube's uh, algorithms and compressions and all that are gonna affect this, but like all videos here on Fidgetal, if you can, watch it in 4K. Thank you very much for listening. I can't wait to hear your thoughts. Now go shoot some film.